uh, we have received the question. The question is that uh, at this moment in the recent day, the number of infected cases is increasing in most of the South Asian country, India, 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 Vanara, you, this is related to you. And it has a negative impact in food security and nutrition. And like the measuring, like the measure, sharing community kitchen, is there a similar measure to combat with this problem? So uh, the question is about the, uh, the number of cases are increasing. It has a negative effect in food security. And how do you manage the community kitchen? Is that, uh, yeah, please talk about your community kitchen. So yeah, uh, basically in India, definitely the cases are increasing. And uh, there, that's why the government has to post the lockdown also initially. But later on, when they also found like the lockdown is was not the end for this virus, but it also causing many other problems like the food and nutrition security, the economic insecurity, high unemployment, and the people are actually migrating from their workplace to back to their houses. So basically, these community kitchens are uh, generally also running in India. So there are many daily wagers who sometimes won't get work they will be actually eat due into these community kitchens where the people who are from the affluent sections, they come up and uh, maybe some NGOs or some of the communities who work in this um, is, the, um, is in the nutrition and the health sectors. They actually bring up this kind of a concept where they are started with this community kitchen where they're distributing at least, for, at least uh, one to two meals of the day or um, maybe a week's ration would be provided to them. But that's not the solution definitely for the food and nutrition insecurity happen due to the lockdown. So the, that's, that's why uh, after the lockdown three, the government has decided to start with the, with the organization and the work sites so that the people can go back to their work and they can earn some money so that their livelihood would get better. So those are the mm. things, but definitely these are not the concrete measures to yeah. take care of food and nutrition insecurities happen. Uh, 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 Professor Vanada is a, she is a, also expert in the nutrition, and uh, I think that the uh, in this very crowded situation in India, the food security is also a very common problem for India, as I noticed is that. So that yeah, uh, yeah. Did, did you? see how people manage to have for like a safer food and are there any problem with that or food security? Uh, no, no, it's like uh, not much but definitely the there is uh, there's three things comes in the food and nutrition security which is the availability, affordability and accessibility. So all these three okay. situations are not lying up like if there are accessibility so the people won't be able to afford it and then it get wasted so that's also one of the reason for food and nutrition insecurity in come in India. So and if sometimes yeah, sometimes there is less of accessibility. So so these kind of a things which is basically causing the food and nutrition insecurity. So the uh, the con continuation with the this discussion. So I noticed that uh, the different country in the United States. The Taiwan the practice the, the law, lockdown, you know, social distancing, isolation at the a very different timing. And then how people are reacting to this social distancing measure is very much the depend on the how much the essential social services are kept sustaining. What I mean is uh, uh, number one is health services, and number two, not only health services, other services such as the food, the water, electricity, logistics. Uh, such services yeah. are very important for uh, enabling the people to practice the uh, social distancing measure. So uh, I want to ask the question, this question to the Dr. Reiner. Uh, Dr. Reiner, I, I was very interested in the question you talk about the, in the Austria, and you face a lot of the people with hypertension crisis and depression. Yeah, how about the essential social services? So at first I learned from your presentation that the government uh, strictly control the movement of the people, but you know we are very impressed with that. How they can practice that? What kind of 
essential social services are kept running? Basically, everything kept running, but the people were scared and forced to stay at home. So, and doctors were scared. Uh, so the hospitals, some doctors, that was not very clearly communicated by the government. They said basically everything which is uh, essential should be open. But hospitals and doctors, uh, because everything went so quick, they decided not to treat certain patients. So for example, I, it's just one example. I had a patient, I said before, with, with a lymphoma around his, uh, in his skin, which grew very rapidly. And I sent them to the radiologist for a sonography. And they said, we're not doing this, it's a lipoma. So I had to use some force to send him and he got some surgery and it was a, a high grade B cell lymphoma. So he was, and, and I hear these cases on and on. So, so there was a problem of communication because everything went so fast and the, the hor horrific, the hor picture, hor horrible pictures from Italy, the people were scared, the whole society was scared. And I think this was wrong to enforce it by the politicians because I think what I see here, like from Taiwan, for example, it was communicated much, much better. And I think maybe they kept their service running. Uh, and in yeah. Europe, we were just like, woo. I was actually, I was in, uh, in Kenya before I came home five days before the lockdown. And I was with a friend of mine who, who stays in Hong Kong. She's from Taiwan. And she was always telling me on her mobile phone what's going on in Taiwan and about COVID. And we heard from Italy and we were thinking Ital in Austria, it will not harm us. But when I came home, after six days, I had to... I had to stay home. Everyone had to stay home. So we were, we were, we were scared. And that was just like, uh, I don't know, I, I could, it was just a very poor communication, I think, from our government. They used, the chancellor used uh, arguments to scare people, like everyone will know someone in the family who dies. But basically, officially, the services kept open. So I think uh, scaring people is not a good measure. You have to inform people and you have to do it based on evidence. And, and in Europe, it, everything was very late. So because, because we thought it's in Asia, it's in China, but on suddenly Italy became the focus and, and, and they reacted in panic. So, so I think they did a lot of mistakes, like concentrating all people on one place in the hospitals and, and nurseries. So I, I can't say more, it's just still a discussion. So now we are discussing about mobile apps and uh, uh, more like uh, fo focusing on the, on the FOTI, on the focus tracing people, which is now coming up, which is much better. But I, I always feel like in Europe, we are more critical about uh, security, internet, privacy. There's discussions that people don't want to use the applications, which I also understand because we, we have our, we have our, we are proud or we are, we are resting in a social societies which are highly developed and individualized. I think in Asia, this is less, Maybe, uh, I don't know. <laughs> and in America, people, I don't know. It's, it's Asia because you live very long here too. A lot of social difference. But as I said, I think the whole, the whole, what we see in the world, the whole uh, SARS-CoV-2 is a little bit blown up by the media. I think uh, we doctors have to inform people. We have to put it in the right uh, context. Many people are dying at a much higher pace from other diseases, but no one is talking about that. I'm not saying this is not dangerous or not of concern, but I think this is, has been taken out of our hands. Even research and everything. It, I, I see it's important, but other things too. So, so even your research community is now talking in Austria, it's, it's a little bit uh, without any direction and many, Epidemiologists are discussing with virologists and immunologists discussing with social researchers and no one, they're not really working together. 
I would say it's a good thing. So I'm solution at this point, yeah. Yes, and uh, yes, and, and in, at this point, uh, may I ask the question, or anyone if you have a you have a time for one question yeah, from the the invited Can audience? I ask that, okay. So I'm uh, oh, I'm from Myanmar. I'm a commissioner of the Human Rights Commission in Myanmar. So that I would like to ask uh, anybody who has a uh, experience in uh, human rights violations in epide epidemic of COVID-19 in your country. Any human rights violation evidence or something like that? Uh, it's quite take, interesting uh, that uh, I want, you, yeah, it's quite interesting. You you just raised a very 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 interesting question. In China, there is really 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 mentioned about human rights. In fact, that they are exposing all the potential um, all the COVID case, case confirmed cases to the public, so people can avoid those people, those confirmed cases. In the community, as long as they are two people or three people are locked down, and those three people's name will be posted on the community board. So people in that community will avoid to contact that person. The way that Taiwan is doing is that um, they don't want to disclose anyone. So they just only announce the region, the province, the city, where they are located. So it will also cause a lot of panics because they, nobody knows who they are. So they can only practice more social distancing and more um, cautious um, measurements, to make sure that everybody might be the one who have COVID. So kind of encourage everybody wear mask because you don't know the one who will sit next to you might be the one. But in China, that everybody know who has it. So it create, it is it, causing a lot of um, stigma, social stigma. So people are trying to avoid to go to the hospital, try to hide it because they are so afraid to get um, isolated from the community. That also causing a lot of issues because those potential issues has been underlined it and then make sure that um, the eruption of the potential cases can pop out. So, there are some two extreme cases that so if you are talking about United States, they don't even want to there's no disclosure of anybody who are COVID cases. So there's no way we can tell. So the public population is more feel like it. There's no way that we can feel that. Even yes, there are close to like a um 1.5 million cases confirmed, but we don't know who they are. So they must not be our neighbors. So you still feel safe, but at the same time that you are really, really high risk. The second thing I want to mention is really the cultural preference. Most Asians are really in the culture that are following, respecting orders. But in Western country, most of the people are really respecting their own rights. So when you talk about that um, regulation from top down government, it will be very, very hard to follow, especially in the United States. Whatever government's um, regulations you are not really believed by most of people. So you don't really believe what people say. <laughs> but in the Asian community, then you will see when you go to the Asian supermarket, almost everybody wear a mask. But when you go to the um, Western supermarket, really people wear masks. They don't believe that kind of beliefs or practice. So it's quite interesting the different culture and different practice are really behind the background. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. So the, uh, it's a very interesting that you compare the, the nature of the European and uh, the Asian people in terms of the right base and culture base. I, I think that in Japan is considering both uh, of this culture and social value as well as the human right. Probably you other sensei may have, uh, or Sato sensei may have some comment on this. <laughs> in Japan, in the case of Japan, the uh, privacy is very sensitive matter. So the, I'm very interested in the uh, Korean, uh, Korean uh, system. Uh, yeah. the, in the, uh, uh, the last week, 
and uh, you know, the uh, infected person was found in the, to attend the uh, live house of the you know, gay people together. But mm -hmm. they and you know, open that the, the uh, who are in, uh, uh, infected are gay uh, broadcasting uh, on the TV to the people. The, uh, uh, somebody uh, from the Korean uh, attend this meeting today. Uh, Co Korean Pro this meeting. Uh, so then he registered, but he could not show up since either. Are you really? Oh. The, <laughs> the background, the social background, the cultural background the, between the Japan and the Korea is very uh, similar, but the, the privacy matter is uh, no, the, uh, the more sensitive in, uh, among the Japanese people. So I would like to know the, uh, what's happened in the Korea. Yeah, it's kind of interesting you mentioned Korea. Um, there are several, several literatures about HIV positive cases that it's the same highly stigmatized disease. And in the community, if the communities have like a 40 or 50% or HIV positive, the self stigma or stigma, social stigma decrease because almost everybody inside the house has one people who are HIV positive. So in that community, it's not that stigmatized. And then they don't really care about their disclosure or their privacy because almost everybody knows. But in a metropolitan area that the people still keep keeping the privacy, that means that you are, um, the conspiracy or you might have it or you don't have it. It's gonna be very, very hard. And especially in the Korean country, um, how the Korea ways to, to expose all the gay bar, gay bar who are exposing COVID-19. It will also increasing the COVID stigma as, as well as HIV stigma that we don't really want to make that um, impression. So it will be very, very dangerous. That kind of topics have been discussed several times in Taiwanese um, CDC. A lot of Taiwanese want to follow up with China um, style why we cannot expose the person, then we know where they are so we can avoid them. But um, the, the one in charge of the China, um, Taiwan CDC announced that he doesn't want to make the, the community or the societies or all stigmatize those people with COVID-19. It will end up those people with potential exposure will avoid to go to the hospital. That will causing the hard, it will be harder, causing too hard to control the pandemic. Because if the person doesn't come to the hospital, there's no way we can detect them until they are dropped dead, like on, die on the street. Then we know there are um, community transmission. It will be too hard to tr do the tracing. It will be out of control to do the tracing, just like in the United States. There's no way we can do the contract tracing because they are already out of control. So far, that is still the bottom line that we don't want to expose anyone who have actually, um, COVID confirmed cases. Except for the person who are tracked three times, still get lost, still cannot find a person, then it will be announced the name and address. So people are trying to find the person and then to drag the person out and then to be locked down in the um, quarantine places. Otherwise, that there is nobody. So far, we don't know who are those 447 cases confirmed. It will be very, very easily to find out 447 positive. But so far, there is no way we can know them. We just only know whether they are in Taipei City or in different city. But we, there is no way we we can know what region or district they are living in. Yeah. Uh, it's like uh, an earlier part of the HIV epidemic. Uh, yeah. It is very important to think about the privacy, human rights. Yes, I think this is very interesting discussion. And uh, I'm sorry, you, I cannot give you some kind of break, but anyway, you can you know, the, keep your computer mute and take a break and listen. So I will jump to uh, next section. The, this is also a very interesting one because it's a collection of ASEAN countries. So I invite the 